Thank you very much. Is this coming through okay? Do you really care? Okay. okay. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you folks. I deeply appreciate it. Uh, Jody's very kind and didn't tell you the real scoop on me. I'm just weird as hell, so bear with me. Okay. Uh, those of you that have heard me speak know that I do not uh, use PowerPoint, so let me explain my arms to you. This is up. This is down. And this is I really am weird as hell. Okay? So that's all I'm going to do with you today. But I truly, uh, and one of the things about being uh, as old as I am, and I'm in my mid and late 60s, uh, is that... Uh, you no longer have to read history because hell you are history. So, but it gives you a perspective on things that, uh, uh, and I, I did grow up on a ranch in the Panhandle of Texas, even though I did grow up on a ranch, uh, the money that I made primarily uh, in FFA and 4-H projects was in, in swine or in pigs, so I have a deep appreciation for the pork industry because they made me money. Cattle were fun, but the pigs made me money. Uh, but in any event, uh, I did grow up in that agriculture, and, and I've seen some ups and downs in it. And so I, when I say that I think it's truly the best time ever to be in agriculture, I'm not going to try to be Pollyannish about it. I'm going to try to give you facts and figures and let you understand it. And I'm not going to try to t take away from the fact that I know some of you may be in stressful times or have stresses, and I'm not trying to make light of that. But overall, when you look at some numbers, man, folks, this is not only the best time ever to be in agriculture. It's the best time ever to be alive, okay? Because there's some fun things going on. And let me start with some that you may not have heard about, and I'll give you the reference on them, but it, it's kind of one of those weird ones that, uh, that is an interesting one. And this one came from the New, uh, New York Magazine, came out in September of 2015. Right before, in the fall of 2015, we had the Paris Accord on Climate Change. And this was in New York Magazine, written by a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Chat. And he, he gave an astounding number. And essentially the title of the present or the article was, this is the sunniest article on climate change that you will read. In other words, a positive article on climate change. And his, his sum total was this. 2014, the last year, and I'll give you the 2015 numbers too. 2014, the last full year that we had data, in keeping records, we had the largest output ever in the world, ever in the world, largest output of production. 72 trillion bucks, okay? Largest ever. Up 2 trillion from the previous year, okay? Largest output ever, and for the first time in keeping records, carbon emissions were down. Only one tenth of 1%. 11% in the US, but one tenth of 1% in the world. So they basically said carbon emissions were flat. First time in keeping records that ever occurred. We've had flat or down carbon emissions, but only during recessions, when output was what? Down. But here was the largest output ever. And you know, and come on folks, 20 years ago at this Congress, you damn sure didn't talk about carbon. Okay? Okay? And all of a sudden, climate change is out there, and all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of carbon. So, down, Fabulous opportunities, though, because his take on it, and, and you know this, Mother Nature sequesters or puts away or stores carbon primarily two ways, in her oceans and in her plants. Okay? So if you're going to have carbon emissions down, you've got to have some sequestering going on, or you've got to be not admit as much carbon out there. So Chat's argument was this. He said, well, we went from 523 coal-fired power generating facilities in the U.S. to uh, 323. We went down by 200, and that was his take on it, that we quit admitting much carbon. I'm not arguing with you, because we did, because we went from coal to natural gas, and coal in general emits less carbon into the atmosphere than natural gas, although coal's not bad, because if you go to SAS Power in Saskatchewan, their coal technology basically is almost the same as natural gas. They pull the carbon out and put it in carbon dioxide in liquid form and put it back into the tar sands in Alberta and in Saskatchewan and sequester it that way. So c coal is not bad, but in any, that was his take that we just quit emitting it. Okay? Not wrong. I'm just if Mother Nature sequestered it in her ocean and in her plants, here's my take on it, okay? Something else occurred in 2014. We recorded for the 21st year, consecutive year, in the United States, we planted more trees by number and by acre than we harvested. 
We, we had 10 years in a row in 2014 where the world planted more trees by number and by acre than we harvested. Hell, that couldn't have been part of it. What do you think? Well, well wait a minute. Brazil took down a whole bunch of people of uh, rainforest. Yeah, but nobody chose to look at the numbers because China planted 5.1 million more acres than they harvested. India planted 5 million more acres than they harvested. Are you with me? The world planted more trees by number and by acre than they harvested 10 years in a row, and in the United States, 21 years. Oh, incidentally, west of, east of the Mississippi, 80% of all the forests are controlled by private enterprise. 60% of those are controlled by the landowners called farmers. And west of the Mississippi, it's 40% are controlled by farmers and ranchers. Oh, but here comes another one. Now is something called prescription agriculture, not precision. Precision is just using the best technology. Prescription is for your farm. Actually, for that little small pot on your farm where we do what now with planters that do what? Every linear inch based upon what? We can do what now? For a number of corn seeds, number of soybean seeds, every linear inch we do what? We determine how many of those seeds are appropriate for that linear inch, that soil type, that farm, every linear inch. And oh, by the way, guess what? With the new multiple variety planters that just came out last year, guess what? In addition to the number of seeds we plant, we can up to right now three different varieties or hybrids picked just for that linear inch. That's pretty good. And in that agriculture, guess what? We can prove continuously we sequester eight times more carbon than what Mother Nature did by herself. And if you have a healthy microbe soil profile, you can add another 8x. Gee, do you think that might have been part of the reason that carbon emissions were down? <laughs> oh, by the way, 2015, the numbers. Output in the world went up another two trillion, seventy-four trillion, and carbon emissions were down two point nine percent. All I'm trying to tell you, folks, is I don't. I'm not making an issue on climate change. I'm telling you this: there's a bunch of carbon out there, and guess what? In a carbon-rich world, you know who owns it? The people that can take it away, and that's agriculture. What I'm trying to tell you is the model was given to us by the Australians, something called ecological service fees. So when you can sequester carbon and you can prove it, then society, at least in Australia, pays you an ecological service fee for doing so. So get ready. Some of the major policy decisions in a carbon-rich world in the future may be evolved about how taxpayers pay you to help get rid of carbon because you're the only ones that can. And I know you're sitting there going, does he understand that we're in the pork business and we're, we're actually uh, maybe producing more carbon? Or, you know, uh, well, folks, guess what? Uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. But we already have technologies that says basically agriculture in general is the way overall that we solve the carbon sequestration problem. Okay? We can quit emitting it, but we've got to get rid of it once it is. And carbon is agriculture's ownership. Get ready for it, folks. Fabulous. One more little thing, and I, it doesn't relate to agriculture, but I just got to throw this one out because uh, it's kind of fun. Okay? If you take the new car today, average new car today, this is kind of a weird one, average new car today, driving down the road at 65 miles an hour, emits fewer harmful things into the environment than the average car sitting dead in the parking lot of 1970. What? That can't be. A car driving down the road at 65 miles an hour is emitting fewer harmful things to the environment than a car sitting dead in the parking lot of 1970. That can't be. Wait a minute. I'm not old enough to remember the car of 1970. And I guarantee you, go back, read some of the press. We were going through a transition in fuel dispensing. And it was what? Self-service. Go back and read it. Oh my God, the papers go, we can't allow people to take this very volatile chemical and put it in their car themselves. You just can't do that. My God, we need somebody that didn't graduate from high school to run out there and put it in there for you. You just can't do self-service. <laughs> what a crock. Okay. 
But so self-service went away. So 1970, I guarantee you, that car of 1970 sitting dead in the parking lot, somebody, one of us, had long since left the gas cap on top of a pump somewhere, so it had a red shop rag sticking out the pipe, okay? And even if it didn't, and it had the original gas cap on it, guess what? It wasn't captive return. So guess what those vapors in that gas tank were sitting there doing? Heading into the atmosphere. You look underneath the automatic transmission, I guarantee you found what? A puddle of oil. Under the engine, probably what? A puddle of oil. Probably a little antifreeze. Are you with me, folks? Average car of 1970, sitting dead in the parking lot. Worse on the environment than the new car driving at 65 miles an hour. Okay? That's fabulous. One of the first jokes you learn if you drive a British sports car like I do is that the reason the Brits could never make color television sets was they couldn't figure out how to make them drip oil. <laughs> so I guarantee the car of 1970 wasn't much fun, folks, okay? But the interesting thing about that car of 1970, and my British sports car is a 1971 MGB, I don't even want to drive it in a parade anymore. Why? because I consider it to be almost a death trap. It didn't have seat belts, doesn't have passive restraints, doesn't have airbags, okay? I can remember when seat belts were first mandatory. My late father, pretty conservative rancher, basically said, oh hell, I'd rather be thrown out of the pickup. <laughs> <laughs> well, so would I, Dad, but not at 70 miles an hour. And right before he passed away in 1991, as he's getting in the car and strapping in, he says, you know, I feel naked now without it, okay? Because folks in 1970, if you're a baby boomer and you go to that Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., and you start walking up to it, and I don't know about you, I can't walk up to it without start getting tears in my eyes because you start seeing names and it becomes a reality. That's what a memorial should do. You start seeing those names, and to date there's 58,219 names on it. And it's, if, it's, if it's your generation to war, then it's, it's passionate to you. But in 1970, ladies and gentlemen, we killed 57,000 Americans on our highways because they truly were death traps. Okay? Those cars really were. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it has fallen to 32,000 and we drive 40% more miles. What I'm trying to tell you folks is the good old days, they sucked. <laughs> they really did folks, they just weren't good, okay? So let's go back to 1970 and let me frame it for you in another way for you. 1970 was an interesting year other than the car. It was the year the United States became the first one trillion dollar economy. The world at that time produced slightly less than four trillion. Okay. So if you do the math, we were about what? One fourth of the output. Okay. 1970, the world had 3.6 billion people on it. Okay. And there was a whole group of people that were trying to be futuristic and trying to forecast the future. And you cannot. Nobody knows the future. Okay. There's an old Arab saying that he who forecasts the future lies, even when they tell the truth. Because even if you forecast something and it came to pass, it wasn't because you knew it. It just happened. We don't know. Okay. So that was a group of people called the Club of Rome. And they basically said, because world's populations were what? Oh, they're just going to grow up. We can't. Oh, 3.6 billion people. Oh, my gosh. We're just going to have so many people. Because there was an interesting thing in 1970 with 3.6 billion people. We could not provide 2,450 calories for those 3.6 billion people. That's what the average human being needs. Men need a little bit more, women need a little bit less. If you're a teenager, you need 10,000. But we couldn't provide <laughs> 2,450 calories on average for every man, woman, and child. Oh, we did quite nicely here, folks, and in a few other countries, but the world could not provide 2,450 calories. So the Club of Rome naturally said, guess what? The world's population is gonna do what? Keep growing, and we just can't provide enough food for those that we have right now, so. <sighs> And so the whole focus in agriculture, folks, in our universities in the 1970s, the 70s, was what? We need to grow two blades of grass for one group of four, which is what Jonathan Swift told us in 1650. You need to learn how to be more productive, produce more calories, that's what it is, just more, because we're starving. So now let's fast forward. 2014, what was the world's output? 
72 trillion. Hmm. And the world, the United States celebrated becoming the world's first $18 trillion economy. Did you do the math? 18, 72, are you with me here? I'll be damned. <laughs> About one fourth. Hmm. So in 2014, the world's population did double. 7.2 billion people. Although the Club of Rome's forecast was that it was going to be 12 billion. They kind of missed that one. <laughs> 7.2 billion people, but here's what you did in agriculture. Now for every man, woman, and child on this planet of those 7.2 billion people, doubled the number of people. It did happen. And we couldn't beat them in 1970. But now there's 2,900 calories. And then I was on a program a few months ago with a scientist from Yale, and he said, well, my number shows 3,100. So I went back, pulled the numbers up. It's 3,200. 3,200 calories for every man, woman, and child for 7.2 billion people. How many do you need on average? 2,450. Hmm. If you do the math real quick, folks, there's a whole bunch of press out there that basically says the world's for, we're, we're, we might go to 9 billion people. You understand that's a forecast. We don't know. Okay, nine billion people, okay? And if it does, guess what? We can't feed them. What an unmitigated crock. Do the math. If we just took the 2,450 that we need, slam dunk already can feed nine billion people. Done. You did it. Thank you. That's powerful. That's what agriculture did, okay? And that is the most profound thing going on. And it is, it, it, everybody misses it, okay? Best time ever to be alive. Because guess what? First time ever we can look in the eye of every man, woman, and child on this planet and basically say, guess what? You can have enough food to live. Because we in agriculture are producing a whole bunch. And oh, by the way, if you pull the numbers down, we basically say there's at least double 40% loss, 40% loss before we ever get it to the processing facility, and 40% loss after processing it into the home. So you look at all of those efficiencies that might be gained over time. What do you think, folks? Think we can produce enough food on this planet for 9 billion people, 10 billion people, 11 billion, I don't care. <gasps> kind of. Okay. So get that out of your mind. The reason it's the best time ever to be in agriculture is the other fundamental thing that happened. In 1970, the second largest economy in the world was the UK. A slightly about $250 billion. We were the first one trillion, you with me? Second largest was one fourth of us, the UK, okay? And we said in economics, in 1970, China, India, and Brazil, with half of the world's population, if we could just get those 1.5 billion Chinese, Indians, and Brazilians to buy one more pair of shoes, we wouldn't have a shoe problem. It's true, but guess what? They didn't have no money. But what was happening? Suddenly, what was happening to incomes? They were starting worldwide to do what? Go up. Okay. So finally, The Economist magazine last year had a positive graph on its cover. I couldn't believe it. I stayed drunk three days over that one. Okay. <laughs> and the cover was this. The number of people living in abject poverty in the world 10 years ago was 2 billion people. That's less than $1.25 a day. And it had fallen to 750 million. Still too many people. You with me, folks? But it's the fastest drop ever in abject poverty in keeping records. And we have the smallest number of people as a percentage of the world's population living in an abject poverty ever in recorded history. Okay? Because incomes started rising. And incomes going up make us weird as hell. Okay? In fact, the late economist John Kenneth Galbraith in 1958 wrote one of, which is always considered to be one of the most 100 influential nonfiction books ever written, and he called it The Affluent society. And he basically said, all of a sudden, we're richer, and it's going to change us. And boy, did it ever. 
And here's the fun thing. It's one of the best times ever to be in agriculture because people get more money here for the pork industry. You know this. The first thing they want to do when people get more money is change their diets. You've seen it. You've read about it. You've heard about it. But understand how profound this is. Okay? The first thing they want to do is change their diets. And the first thing they want to add to their diets is what? Animal-based proteins in the form of beef, pork, chicken, lamb, you name it, milk, eggs, cheese, animal-based proteins, that's the first thing they want to add to their diets. Okay? And when they get more money, they want to do that. I ran the numbers for China for the heating and air conditioning folks. Seven-fold increase in window air conditioning units went to China. Five-fold increase to India. They got enough money, they said, hell, we're tired of being hot. Okay? <laughs> I ran the numbers for India, for the beef folks. Beef, India is not a country known culturally or religiously for eating beef. It's sacred. Enough Indians got enough money in the last decade, beef consumption doubled. Enough Indians got enough money, they said, hell, we're going to eat a cow. <laughs> it's not wrong or right, it's just, guess what? The world wants meat-based protein. Here's the takeaway for you. It is not going to come from what I call pastoral agriculture. Pastoral agriculture is what? I want, I want to see those beautiful dairy cows grazing on green grass. It's pretty. It is pretty. I'm not knocking it. In fact, I'm going to tell you, you can make some money off of that too. I'm just trying to tell you. You want to because we run, I run the numbers two ways for you. Okay? If the world's population goes to 9 billion people, but there's another effect too. The reason people, when they get more money, want to buy more meat-based proteins is something called the income effect. In economics, we call it income elasticity. How much more are you going to spend? That's a fancy name for basically you're going to spend more money on animal-based proteins. And the answer is, yeah. Okay. So if you just do that, don't increase the population. Just do that. We have to 50% meat animal-based protein just to satisfy that. Just the income effect. If you add 9 billion people, add another couple billion people, we got a 2x meat production, okay? Got a 2 exit. okay? That's why it can't be done by pastoral agriculture. In visiting with geneticists, visiting with the latest in drone and remote sensing technology for animal care on open pasture systems, the best we can say is probably 20%. So how are we going to 2x meat? We're going to do it in intensive animal operations, which is what you do. And you know why. Number one, study after study proves that the negative effect on the environment from intensive animal operations is what? It's less than open pasture systems. Okay? It's concentrated. We can manage it better. The overall physical health of the animal is better and the overall efficiency of all the inputs. I'm old enough to remember my first feeds and feeding class. To get a pound of pork used to say what? Three pounds of feed. Come on, folks. Most of you in this room is what? 1.3, 1.5? That's poultry. That's fish. Better efficiency of inputs, smaller negative impact on the environment, better physical health. Okay? We're going to 2x meat. We're going to do it in intensive animal operations. Gee, is there any wonder why the Chinese want to buy up all the pork facilities in the United States? I'm not. I'm not. That's not the white elephant in the room, folks. It's happening. Done. Because guess what? Who has the best comparative advantage of, if you do intensive animal operations, that means what? Yeah, you've got to have some forage. You can let them graze. But guess what? They gotta have what? Corn and soybeans, grain, sorghum, wheat, whatever you want to. You gotta have plants and you gotta have grain. And the place that has the best infrastructure for everything, roads, finance, entrepreneurship, skills, are you with me folks? Is where? Here. We own the world's demand for more meat. That's why it's the best time ever to be in agriculture. Come on, folks, you're number three in pork production in Minnesota right now. Come on, kick ass. Because <laughs> the world wants it, okay?
But here's the other takeaway for you. That's why I say I'm not I'm not trying to pick on open pasture systems or you know letting the sows out and wander around on the farm. I'm not talking about that. I, that's I, I, let's talk about how you can make some money on that because guess what? Okay. As we grow and increase in income, money changes people at the poverty level and at every level. Okay? And the best way to do it, I don't, I don't, I, my final PowerPoint to you is this, okay? okay? It's a guy by the name of Abraham Maslow, okay? First time I got Abraham Maslow studied it in college, he talked about everybody went through a pyramid, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. I remember the first time I get that in college, I'm thinking, is this crap going to be on the test? Jesus, Joseph, <laughs> what a crock. Whoopee, so philosophical, what a bunch of crap. That Maslow proved to be pretty smart, because Maslow said what? At the very base, humans want what? Food, clothing, and shelter. Make sure you got food in your belly, make sure somebody's not stealing it from you. This is the basics of life. This is where my father's generation, what Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation, this is where they grew up. My mom will turn 90 in May, still lives on a ranch, still saves aluminum foil. Okay? Not wrong or right, just, okay? It's the basics of life, you know? Look, well, it's not Starbucks, it's four bucks. Not wrong or right, just, this is where they grew up. But none of the rest of us did. Because okay? Maslow said this, if you could get beyond this, what would be the next level? Love and acceptance. Find somebody to share it with. And then finally at the top would be what? Self-actualize. Find yourself. Okay? Culturally neutral. Everybody goes through this. But as the world rises and has more people in the middle class than at any time in history, they're leaving here and moving where? To love and acceptance. Let me ask you something. What do you think is happening to the dog population and the cat population and the pet population in China? Think Purina sending a little dog chow to China? Come on, folks. We have more horses in America today than we did when we were a horsepower society. Did you hear that number? Have more horses today than when they did all the work. And they don't do cat today. <laughs> Average horses ridden twice a year. They used to pull us and our freight up and down the roads. Now we pull them up and down the roads. <laughs> Not wrong or right, folks. Okay? Because as we provided... Here's, here's an interesting takeaway for you. If we kept agricultural technology, and this just isn't my number, but it is my number, but I pulled it from a lot of sources to get it. In other words, I stole liberally from a bunch of people. Okay? If you steal from one source, that's plagiarism. If you steal from more than one, it's called research. Okay. <laughs> so I stole from a bunch, but I put the number together this way. If we kept agriculture technology flat in the United States and the world of 1970, to feed and have what we have today for the 7.2 billion people, we would need a land mass the size of Canada, the United States, and China combined. Three billion acres would have to not be in protected areas of waterways, open systems, forest, just to produce the food. Gee, do you think wildlife is better off now than it was? See, the indirect consequence of a productive agricultural technology is we have 100 times more deer than we did 100 years ago. Probably some of you dodged some on the way here. <laughs> okay, Because the Midwest has a hell of a lot more deer than anybody in the world. We have 10 times more elk. And agriculture, in some indirect way, provides the feed and supplemental habitat for 10 billion head wildlife. Folks, are you with me? 
not only is it the best time ever to be alive for us, it's the best time ever to be alive if you're a wildlife of some kind. Because agriculture technology did some fabulous things. Okay? Fabulous. Fabulous. Best industry to be in. You did all of that and nobody even gives you recognition for it. Staggers the imagination. My belly's full. And here comes Maslow. Okay? In 1970, how many craft breweries did we have in America? <laughs> Budweiser, shut up. 4,000 now. And we had at least five a week. Because when you go from here to here, you get weird. I want moose drool. And could it be organic? And gluten free? Come on, folks. We have the most critical shortage of hops ever in history. You want to make a fortune, <laughs> sell the pigs, grow some hops, okay? It's a weed, it'll grow anywhere. I'm teasing you a little bit, okay? Because I don't know about you, the last craft beer I had had so damn much hops in it. It took three Coors Lights to get the taste out of my mouth. Let me tell you, okay? okay? <laughs> we did not measure organic 20 years ago. It's 5% of the retail sector. We didn't measure gluten f intolerance 10 years ago. It's the fastest growing segment in the food, of those 20,000 new food products, fastest growing segment, gluten free. Wait a minute, hard scientific evidence says what? One half of 1% of the population has any form of gluten intolerance, any form of celiac disease. One half of 1%. It's over 2% of the retail sector in what? As a friend of mine said, well, Lowell, I know I'm not gluten intolerant, I just feel better when I eat gluten free. I said, you feel better because you didn't eat three loaves of bread at dinner last night. <laughs> Not wrong or right, it's just, I'm trying to tell you, guess what? In this world, it's what? It is craft breweries. It is now. Every single state now, you used to say bourbon was what? Kentucky bourbon. No, bourbon just by definition has to be what? More than 50% 50, 50 plus of the grain has to be corn and you have to age it at least four years in new American oak barrels. You can call it bourbon. It doesn't have to be Kentucky. Every single state has micro distilleries that produce bourbon. And have you seen the latest one? Organic vodka. What? <laughs> like 90 proof and going to kill every damn thing in the bottle? <laughs> But I met the lady this summer, she said, Lord, you can make fun of me all day long. I'm pushing the production people. I can sell ten times as much as I can get. I go, who in the hell buys organic vodka? She goes, mostly people that go to spas. <laughs> as I said, my mom will turn 90 in May. She still lives on a ranch in the Panhandle of Texas, and I guarantee you probably today, She's out doing what ranch people do in the Panhandle of Texas. What you do here in Minnesota is you're out breaking ice so the cattle can get water. Hmm? I don't think she's ever been to a spa. <laughs> I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just trying to tell you best time ever to be alive. Okay. Folks, in 1970, we spent 20% of our disposable income in America just to eat. The world was spending 60%. Hmm. Today, what is it? Well, you ought to be proud of this one, too. Ten percent. I hate fractions. It's actually 9.7. You understand? Agriculture's efficiency. You didn't have to do jack as an American from 1970, your income didn't have to rise at all. And you folks gave back to the average American consumer 10% of their income. They didn't have to do jack, just the privilege of being an American living in this wonderful agricultural base. Your efficiency gave them back 10% of their income because you don't spend jack on food. Okay, That's fabulous. 
And oh, by the way, how many meals did you eat away from home in 1970? Well, the average was once a week. Now it's one out of every two. Gee, do you think there's been a rise in restaurants in the United States since 1970? Kind of. Oh, by the way, the world dropped from 60% to 40%. That's why the world wants a whole bunch of things, too. Okay? Best time ever to be in agriculture, folks. Oh, by the way, and if I showed up on your farm, if you grew a little corn, anybody grow a little corn in addition to your pork? Okay. Anybody grow some corn? Yeah. If I showed up on your farm and and said, in 1970, you're way too young for it, you, would, you wouldn't even been alive, but in any event, but I showed, uh, showed up on your farm in 1970 and asked to buy uh, 10 acres in about the silk stage, and you say, what are you going to do with it? It's not corn yet. Well, well, I don't want to plow it down. And you would have said, what? What in the hell are you talking about? Well, I want to plow it down. You want to plow down a corner of it? No, I, it'll be kind of random. It'll look like it's random, but from 50,000 feet, it'll look like Darth Vader's mask. <laughs> what would you have said to me? You're crazy as a loon. You would have said, which is French for, what in the hell are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? And I would have said, well, I'm going to call it a corn maze. And you'll charge people five bucks to go in it, and they're going to get lost. <laughs> and you charge them 15 bucks to extract them. And people would ask my late father if they could come hunt deer or pheasant or quail on our ranch when I grew up as a kid. His comment to him always was, make sure you shut the gate and do you know what a cow looks like? <laughs> Ecotourism or ag tourism is now fully 10% of net farm income because people want to what? They may want to hunt deer and they may want to just watch deer. Are you with me, folks? That's this world. Never had it before. It's also this world. I want free-range chickens. We had free-range chickens on the ranch I grew up in. We called them the neighbors. Okay. <laughs> but if you, and I'm not make, I could not make this stuff up. Okay. And I, and I saw, I'll tell you too, have you seen the latest trend in, in poultry? You need to know this. I know you're in poultry. You need to know it. The latest trend is slow chickens. That's called roadkill where I grew up. Okay. <laughs> what are slow chickens? Come on, anybody, anybody seen this too? Don't want rapid growth chickens. There's a whole bunch of consumers that'll pay for what? Well, slow growth because the muscle fibers will be more compressed and... <laughs> I don't know. I don't make this stuff up. It's silly people. Okay? I want slow chickens. How about slow hogs? No? Well, as my late father said, when the French first said they didn't want to buy any more American beef, I remember his comment was, well, why? And the answer came back because we had antibiotics in them. And the French said, we're not going to buy any more beef. This was many years ago. And my late father's comment was, well, I'll make all the beef they want to without antibiotics in them. If they pay me. I don't know. I don't know what a slow pig is. But there's a whole bunch of people paying for so slow chickens. Okay. And have you seen this one too? I saw this one and it pertains to every livestock. Be assured when you eat our products, whether it be a plant or an animal, they are raised totally without mechanization. Best time ever to be in agriculture because side by side you can provide pork to export to the world for 2x meat. You can also provide the kind of pork that weird people want. <laughs> Never had that before. And it all predicated upon what? World wealth, folks. Get ready, folks. Fabulous time to be involved in all of it. Fabulous time. Best time ever to be in agriculture. But let me share just a few trends with you to get ready for some really revolutionary things that go on. And let me 
first and start with, with the trend that I think is going to impact us most. In, and it's not just in agriculture, it's in every industry on the planet. If you take this riser and you just go about a foot deep, about a foot deep, a little bit narrower than this, and a little bit shorter, that's, you can get a, a vision for that. It was actually about three feet tall, about two and a half feet wide, and about a foot deep. Okay? That was the computer that we used in the Apollo moon program. Okay? That was the computer that we used to safely land 12 men on the moon, have them walk, and come home. Okay? Neil Armstrong landed in July of 1969. He was first man, and the last man tragically just died yesterday. You saw it in the paper, Gene Cernan. He didn't know at the time he was the last man to walk on the moon, but he was. He died yesterday at age 82 last man to walk on the moon, and that was in December of 1972. Twelve men walked on the moon, safely brought them home with a computer that. Hmm. My galaxy, it's not a seven, you don't have to back up, okay. okay. <laughs> my galaxy, my smartphone, I know it's smart because I cannot understand a damn thing it does, okay. Okay. is 32 million times more powerful. That doesn't even register with me, does it you? Here's a computer that took men to the moon and brought them back, and this thing in my hand is 32 million times more powerful? Ah! I, it defies logic. I don't understand it. What you have to take away on this is, for all intents and purposes, computer speed and computer capacity is infinite. Folks, my generation... Because if you're old enough to remember, and you don't have to be too old to remember what we call we were calling the Y2K problem, all the computers were going to shut down in the year 2000. Why? Because computer capacity was so precious that those of us that programmed in machine language, base two mathematics, zeros and ones, those of us that did that, it was so precious that we lobbed off the last two di the, the first two digits, thinking, "What the hell? We can save two digits." And we caused a whole mega millions of dollars of an industry saying, oh, they're going to shut down because of your stupidity. It was all because it wasn't infinite and it was limited and now it is infinite. What are you going to do in that world? Let me tell you the first one and I'll give you another reference for it, okay? This one came from Kevin Kelly. And he was former managing editor of Wired, so I'm giving you his number. He said in 2015 that we put transistors in things other than computers, which is what a computer runs on, you with me? Every electronic transistor, you with me? We put transistors in things other than computers in this number in the world in 2015. Five quintillion. I don't know about you, I had to look up what a quintillion was. I don't know. Okay. Well, I looked it up, I was still going, holy crap, I still don't understand. Well, it's a trillion trillion, so here, here, folks, it's a billion trillion, okay? So I have to put it in things I understood. So I go, okay, what is five quintillion? That's the number of transistors and things other than computers. So I took a dollar bill, measured it, taped it together, measured the length of it, and then had to take the width of it, and I don't have a micrometer good enough for that, so I Googled it, okay, to get the thickness of it. And I started taping them together philosophically. Would it go around the Earth at its widest point, the equator, at roughly 24,950 miles? Would five quintillion do that with dollar bills taped together? Well, you'll have to keep going and keep going and keep going till you build a solid wall of money wrapped around the widest point on the Earth's surface, the equator, until it is a mile and a half high. 8,000 feet. Then you run out of five quintillion. I was on a program a few months after I ran that thought experiment with a gentleman from the FBI's Cyber Crimes Division, and he said the estimate of the FBI in the United States is 99.8% of all things that have transistors in them aren't connected to each other. But they will be. So here's the takeaway. It's called cognition. It means when you got a transistor in something, guess what? 
it can start doing what? Communicating and giving information to the other one. Okay? There's a lot of people who use the number called the Internet of Things. Large I, small O, big T. Some people call the Internet of Everything. Small, big I, small O, big E. It, either way, it means the same thing. Everybody's talking. Everything's starting to be connected. When everything starts being connected, you know that's why we have prescription agriculture. When we can do what? Plant the number and varieties of seeds per linear inch. That's because what? We have a cloud of information that says what about that particular location in the field. Are you with me, folks? All I'm trying to tell you, if you listen to Paul, Dr. Sunderland, this morning on working on swine-related diseases and, and the health of those, guess what? You will not produce any animal in the future, anywhere, nor will you produce any corn plant, any soybean plant, anything in agriculture that is alive in any way without it having a remote sensor in it. It's going to have a transistor in it. Every day the walls fall in material science to where we can build transistors just saw one yesterday. We now can use laser jet printers and print a new layer on top of every silicon solar panel in the country for about a penny, and it increases its efficiency by 15%. Essentially free. Holy cow, folks. Everything's going to be connected. Think for a minute, though. When you do that, and we're globally positioned, okay? We know where you are, right? You got one of these things? Folks, go back to 1970. How many cell phones did we have in 1970? None. Okay? Took us to 1985 to get to a quarter of a million. How many do we have today? We have 1.5 for 330 million Americans. Half of this room has two. Okay. We know where you are. Okay. So here comes the smartphone technology. This is global position. Folks, you understand GPS was not desynthesized to the point that it was usable till the year 2000. Okay. So when you get GPS now that is so precise, they know where I'm at. They don't. They know I'm not sitting down. They know I'm what? Behind the riser. That's good because it's created whole new industries. I don't need to tell you that Fortune magazine said the most valuable company in the world now that is private is which one? Came out of nowhere. And you better understand it. It's called Uber. What is Uber? It's, let's see. You got a car and you're going to drive south today and I need to go south for 50 miles and oh by the way it hooks up my need to go south 50 miles and you're going south further than 50 miles but what the hell you got a seat in your car for five bucks you do what? You'll take me and oh by the way I bring the beer. Uber became the most valuable private company ever in history, not because Detroit did anything, no change in transportation technology, no change in fuel technology, simply an understanding computer capacity and in infinite, and when you can communicate and talk to each other, guess what? You got a need to go somewhere, you got an ability to get them there, pay something to somebody to do it. Gee, let's see, Marriott just bought out Starwood and said very proudly we are the largest now provider of hotel space in the world. True. But not the largest provider of rooms for hire. That belongs to whom? Airbnb. Your empty nesters, I want to stay on a farm and you got your son or daughter's room and you just say what the hell. Ten bucks, come stay with us. Bring the beer. <laughs> Largest provider of rooms for hire. All because of what? Infinite capacity of computers. And hook them together and make them talk to each other. Hmm. Uber's founder says this, and you better listen to him. Anything that moves, we want to own it. Not own it in the literal sense. 
We want to be part of it. Gee, Amazon became the world's largest retailer, eclipsing even Walmart. How? Because they sold that many books? No, the platform that they built just says what? I can sell you a book or I can sell you what? Cheese. <laughs> what the hell? Or slow pork. Get ready, folks. When Uber says anything that moves, oh, oh, by the way, guess what? They're now providing nursing staffing in Boston. You're a nurse in Boston? You got a need for an acute care nurse in the emergency room on Tuesday night? Uber has a nurse and will do what? Make sure the nurse does what? It changes labor markets. Get ready for a change in the acquisition of inputs in agriculture and the selling of the final products because they're the largest and fastest growing agribusinesses right now to do what? Okay. Well, your farm's wet today. I guarantee you there's a co-op in Iowa that does this. Your farm's a little bit wet today. So we were scheduled to put a little ammonia down today, but guess what? You're five miles away and we just looked at the weather patterns and we're going to go to yours and you let us go to yours and we'll get back to you when you're dry enough to do it and it'll be more efficient and guess what? We'll save you 5%. Get ready for a major change in inputs, a major change in outputs and selling of everything because of this. Okay. Oh, and one other one that changes dramatically. Any anybody uh, go to a doctor of late? Okay. You go to the doctor and you show up on time. And how many of you got in to see the doctor on time? There's no disrespect to the doctors. What? Yeah. They got caught up with another patient. You know. I understand that's understandable. But wait a minute. And then finally some person comes in and says, What? The doctor will see you now. Oh, whoopee. Just missed my dental appointment. Okay. And it's happy hour. I'm out of here. Okay. Uh, well, there's a book written by, by a doctor, and he basically says, The patient will see you now. Wait a minute, you're busy. What? I know where you are. I know when the doctor just checked out and signed the form for the last patient, and I know by the time he fills out the paperwork for the front staff, that's four and a half minutes, so guess what? You're four minutes away, so I just do what? Hmm. The patient will see you now. Hmm. Every pig, every cow, every chicken, every animal, every plant, is going to be talking to each other. Okay? And what a day that will be because guess what? When an animal activist says something to you, well, you're not treating those pigs right, what can you say? <laughs> <laughs> We've watched them for 24 hours. The one you're talking about had a party with two others. <laughs> okay? Because with this technology, here comes the final thing to think about on that one. Okay? Peugeot did it, the big French car company. Okay? We're getting better at this because when computers are essentially infinite, guess what? We do something called facial recognition technology, and it's real good, okay? We can do facial recognition technology. Now computers can do it so good it's unbelievable. And in fact, the number for downtown in, in the central part of London today is, if you're a tourist in London, in an average five-hour period, you will be watched at least 500 times. Not just your photograph taken, but not only facial recognition, but your mood. Peugeot has identified seven different emotional states, and the car you could buy it, the 2016 model year, you could buy it in fall of 2015. The 2017 model year is gonna have another feature, but it's available. You get in Peugeot's car, you look in the rear view mirror, it makes a determination 95% accurate on seven emotional states. If you get in and you are melancholy, it starts playing peppy music. You get in and you're mad, it won't start. <laughs> you get in and you're mad and your pupils are dilated, it not only won't start, it locks the doors, calls the cops. I, it, it can do it, okay? All Peugeot wanted to do with that was, with music, do what? Try to change your mood, okay? William Congreve has always been misquoted. 200 years, he was 
misquoted as saying, music that soothes the savage beast? Always a misquote. What William Congreve said rightly was, music that soothes the savage breast, meaning music has the ability to change human emotions. You've known that. We've known it. That's all Pujo wants to do. You get in the car, detects your mood, your music or theirs, tries to change it. The 2017 model year adds aromatherapy. First new vehicle my late father purchased on the ranch in the Panhandle of Texas, I never will forget. He had to specify whether he wanted a radio and a heater. Now the damn thing knows my mood and squirts perfume on my rear end when I leave. <laughs> And oh, by the way, drives itself. John Deere says they have 200,000 autonomous uh, tractors in the world. Going to add more. Are you with me, folks? Get ready when computer capacity and speed is infinite. All I'm trying to tell you is, guess what? In the future, you will be able to say to people, when everything is connected, not only the physical health of those pigs, but what? Their mental health as well. Okay. Best time ever to be in agriculture. Best time ever to be alive. And thank you for making the world better fed, more animals with a better life than at any time in history. And you did it. Thank you.